appreciated. And we're going to finish up the topic of the Bible this morning. We started it last Sunday morning, and this is just a basic outline. Uh, as I said last Sunday morning, this could have been the first chapter in the discussion. And remember, we are going over the chapters found in this book, First Steps for New Christians. This could have been the first chapter because really the Bible and how we view the Bible affects uh, our entire faith. We know the Bible says in the book of Romans, chapter number 10, that faith cometh by hearing. It says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so really this could have been the first chapter. Nonetheless, Brother Chapel felt led of the Lord to, to make it the seventh chapter. And this is the seventh lesson in our series here. And so on the top of your paper there, I didn't just simply write the Bible, although we could. Uh, and we would understand what that means. But I wrote the King James Bible. Uh, when I refer to the Bible, you folks know in our church that I'm referring to the King James Bible. Nonetheless, there are many people out there that uh, don't know and are confused about the different versions of the Bible. And we understand that the Bible, God's Word, is the King James Bible. And that all the other versions out there are uh, man's, I should say, the devil's way of twisting God's Word, using man to do so. And we want to make sure that we stay with the, the good old book, the King James Bible. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get right into our lesson. Father, thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for all that you've given to us. Lord, I thank you for each and every person here this morning. Lord, I know that uh, with the weather outside being colder today than it has been, being overcast, Lord, that many of us uh, could have made the decision to to sleep in and come a little bit later. But Father, I thank you for each and every person who has made the effort to get here, to be here for this service. And I pray that you bless their faithfulness this morning. Lord, I pray that you be with the teenagers in their class, the young people across the way in the junior class. And Father, once again, may you speak to all of us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, real quickly here, we're not going to review uh, in depth everything that we was covered last Sunday morning, but you do have some uh, some terms that are defined that we have talked about and some terms that we have used and that we will use here in the future as we continue through this book. And so real quickly, just reading these terms, first off is wisdom, which is godly discernment that comes from a knowledge of God's word. Wisdom starts with knowledge. And remember, we said that wisdom is really Knowledge applied. And I, without sounding repetitious or sounding like a broken record, I, I just try to point you back to the illustration of the knife. We know we have knowledge that uh, of a knife and that a knife has two sides. One side is dull, one side is sharp. And so when we try to cut something with the sharp side of the knife, we are applying that knowledge and we are using that knowledge. That is wisdom. If we didn't apply that knowledge, if we tried to cut something with the dull side of the knife, we would be foolish uh, and we would be acting foolish. And so that is wisdom. It's godly discernment that comes from a knowledge of God's word. Second word, inspiration, which means God breathed or relayed his words to the human writers. In other words, he relayed to them what he wanted them to write. And every word that is in the King James Bible is what God wanted them to write. So, third word, inerrancy. The Bible is without error. There are no mistakes in the Bible. Uh, fourth word, righteousness, which means moral purity or morality, really. Uh, next word, doctrine. What is right according to the Bible and remember, we said doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction all go together. Doctrine is what is right, according to the Bible. Reproof is what is wrong or displeasing to God. Correction is how to make our wrongs right, and instruction is how to stay right. And so last Sunday morning, we went ahead and talked about that first heading there. Who is the author of the Bible? And we looked at 2 Peter 1 verses 20 and 21. So turn over there with me if you would real quickly. 2 Peter chapter number 1. And let's read verses 20 and 21 once again. And then we'll get into our next portion of this, this lesson. Who is the author of the Bible? God is the author of the Bible. This is His Word. 
And over there in the book of 2 Peter, we have these words written for us. In chapter number 1 and verse number 20, the Bible says here, Verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And from these two verses, we get these three thoughts. The Bible was not made by men. Men of God recorded the Bible, and God is the author of the Bible. He is the one who told them what to write, every word of it. Remember, as we already looked at that word inerrancy, if man had written this all out of his own will, out of his own desire, there would be errors in there. Not only would there be errors, there would be contradictions. There are no errors, there are no contradictions in this book. Now, as we said last Sunday morning, skeptics, critics will attack the Bible. They've always attacked the Bible, and they're always going to attack the Bible. And that's why it's important for us to know what the Bible says and compare Scripture to Scripture. Because anybody can take one verse or they can take one uh, uh, phrase out of a verse and try to say that the Bible is contradicting itself. But when you compare Scripture with Scripture, you ultimately see that there are no errors and there are no contradictions. Which led us to that saying at the end of this uh, section of the lesson, men do not reject the Bible because it contradicts itself. Really, people don't. They may say that's their reason, but they don't. They reject it because it contradicts them. It contradicts the way that they're living. It makes them admit that they are a sinner and that they are in need of a Savior. And that's why men reject the Bible. Let's look at the next question here. How can we defend our Bible? How can we defend our Bible? All right, there are many proofs that support the Bible. Turn over with me now to 1 Peter chapter number 3 and verse number 15. 1 Peter chapter number 3 and verse number 15. There are many books today that claim to be the Word of God. Many intelligent scholars have written books that attempt to discredit the authority of the Bible. One of Satan's goals is to get man to doubt the Word of God. And Remember, he did this as early in history as the Garden of Eden, when in Genesis chapter number 3, his words to Eve were this, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Question mark. He attacked God's words or what God had said right there in the Garden of Eden with the first woman, with uh, uh, Adam and Eve, and he continues to attack God's word today. Why? He wants to discredit God's word because, as we said, God's word is what builds our faith from Romans chapter number 10. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So if he can discredit the Word of God, if he can destroy our view of God's Word as it being holy, without error, and from God, then he can ultimately destroy our faith, or he can kill our faith. The world, we must remember, is in rebellion against God. And worldly people, under the influence of Satan, seek to destroy our faith. The uh, counter... To counter this attack, it must it is important for Christians to have an answer that will enable them to make a solid defense of their faith when attacked. It's important that we defend this book, that we defend the Bible. So in light of the times we live in, it's important for us as Christians not only to know what we believe, but also why we believe it. In 1 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 15, and the Bible says here, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We need to be prepared to give answers to people who have questions about this book, who have questions about our faith. As I've mentioned before, as I've gone out uh, door knocking over the last uh, several months, and talk to people, there are so many people that when you ask them about going to heaven, they will say, you know, I'm not sure, or I think so, or I hope so. And when you ask some people how they know for sure, they can't give you an answer from the Bible. Uh, we even had, and I mentioned this before, uh, an individual, we knocked on their door, and the person said, yeah, I believe uh, that I'm going to heaven. And they said, well, why? 
why do you believe that? Or how do you know that? Could you tell us? And the person said, well, you know what? Bible answers aren't really my area. I've been going to the same church for 70 some years. But if you want to answer that, you have to talk to my preacher. And once again, that's a that's a sad thing. The pastor, yes, he's supposed to study the word of God. And yes, the pastor's supposed to know the word of God. But the, every Christian is supposed to study the word of God and know the word of God. And you know what? There are going to be many times when I, as your pastor, am not with you. And someone's going to ask you a question. So it's important for every one of us to know what does God's word say. Proving the trustworthiness of the Bible should be no different than pro proving any book's reliability. The Bible is reliable not only in matters of faith and practice, but also in areas of science and history, archaeology, and geography. Now let me go over these four proofs with you real quickly. First, proof number one, indestructibility. No other book has been attacked more than the Bible. And that's what we mean by indestructibility. It has on, undergone every kind of scrutiny possible, from archaeology to science to philosophy, even to computers. Yet despite all these attacks, the Bible proves itself to be true. Each time the skeptics have been wrong and the Bible has proven itself to be right. Some of you may be familiar with a gentleman by the name of Robert Ingersoll. Robert Ingersoll uh, was at one time a devoted atheist. And he boasted, within 15 years, I'll have the Bible lodged in a morgue. However, within 15 years of his statement, Robert Ingersoll was lodged within a morgue, and the Bible was not. And the Bible still lives to this day. In the 8th century, 18th century, excuse me, the atheist French philosopher Voltaire predicted that within 100 years, the Bible and Christianity would be swept out of existence and passed into history. Yet just 50 years after his death in 1778, the Geneva Bible Society purchased Voltaire's house and press and began using it as a publishing house for Bibles. All right, that's irony for you right there. It is indestructible. The Word of God is indestructible. Man has tried to change it. The devil has tried to destroy it, but it has continued on. That's one proof of its reliability. Second proof, evidence from prophecy on the back side of your uh, lessons there. Turn over with me, if you would, to the Old Testament book of Micah. Micah chapter number 5. Micah chapter number 5 and verse number Two. Micah chapter number 5 and verse number 2. In approximately 700 B.C., the prophet Micah named the tiny village of Bethlehem as the birthplace of Israel's Messiah. And we read it here in Micah chapter number 5 and verse number 2. He writes here, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephratah, thou, though be... Uh, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall, be, uh, shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Here, 700 B.C., 700 years before the Lord Jesus Christ, Micah, under the leading of the Holy Spirit of God, prophesies that the, the Savior is going to be born in Bethlehem. Remember the story of the wise men in Matthew chapter number 2. The wise men went to Jerusalem, believing that uh, he was going to be born there in Jerusalem, the Savior, because he was the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And what better place for a king to be born than in Jerusalem, which served at the, as the capital city in the Old Testament of the, the country of Judah or the southern kingdom. And so they went to Jerusalem only only to find out that, no, he was born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem was a little village. It was a, a tiny village in comparison to Jerusalem. Yet Micah, under the leading of the Holy Spirit of God, prophesied that's where he would be born, and he was. That's just one of many instances throughout the Bible where a prophet prophesied a future event, and it came to pass. So not only is our Bible, the Word of God, proven to be accurate and reliable because of its indestructibility, but also because of the fulfillment of prophecy found in it. Proof number three, evidence from archaeology. Evidence from archaeology. Middle Eastern archaeological investigations have proven that the Bible is true and unerringly accurate in its historical descriptions. Nelson Gluck, a renowned Jewish archaeologist, 
states no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference or gone contrary, or proven anything contrary to what the Bible said about it. Dr. William Albright, who uh, lived from 1891 to 1971, uh, was known as one of the greatest archaeologists of his generation, and he said this about the Bible. There can be no doubt that archaeology has confirmed the substantial historical accounts of the Old Testament. For years, skeptics thought the story of the falling walls of Jericho were a myth. And even to this day, stories in the Old Testament, such as Jonah and the whale and Jer the battle of Jericho, are considered by skeptics to be a myth. However, in the 1930s, uh, a man by the name of John Garstang made a remarkable discovery. He stated, as to the main fact then, there remains no doubt the walls fell outwards so completely the attackers would be able to clamber up and over the ruins of the city. This statement itself is remarkable because the city walls did not fall inward, as many people would think, uh, uh, or fell inward, excuse me, and not outward. And so uh, we have here that the archaeology or archaeologists have uh, uncovered so many things over the years to prove that the walls of Jericho fell exactly how the Bible states. And throughout the Bible, there are things that have been stated that archaeology has supported, not controverted. Fourth proof, evidence from science. Turn over to Leviticus chapter number 17, if you would, with me. Leviticus chapter number 17 and verse number 11. The fourth proof, here in Leviticus chapter number 17 and verse number 11, we find is science. And once again, this is just one of many instances in the Bible where science proves the Bible rather than disproving the Bible. Here in Leviticus chapter number 17, look at verse number 11. The Bible says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Here at the beginning of that verse, it said, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. This was, though we, we understand this, this was not understood until very recent times. In the 19th century, doctors were using a procedure known as bloodletting as a healing method, thinking that this would help people to get better when they had an illness. In fact, George Washington, America's first president, died from this practice or was a victim of this practice, this bloodletting, letting out the blood, hoping to get the impurities or the, the whatever uh, disease or ailment they had out of the blood. And what we have learned since then is that the life is in the blood. And the Bible had talked about it way back in the book of Leviticus. So science does not disprove the Bible, but rather proves the Bible to be accurate or to be true. So with all of these things in mind, the things that man are, uh, and men are trying to take and use to attack the Bible really defend the Bible. And that's how we know that our Bible is reliable. That's how we know we can trust the Word of God and how we know we can defend it without any reservation whatsoever. On your papers there, it should have the quote from D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was a great preacher who had a church there in Chicago, and he is known as the father of the Sunday school movement. He's the one who really got the Sunday school movement in churches going. And he wrote this or, or said this, there's no better book with which to defend the Bible than the Bible itself, which is what we have been saying all along, that the Bible proves its uh, its reliability. It proves its inerrancy. All right, let's go on to the next section. Why should we read our Bible? Why should we read our Bible? This should be uh, fairly elementary for anyone who's been saved for any length of time. Nonetheless, let's look at what Brother Chapel writes here in the book about why we should read our Bible. First off, the Word of God brings growth. The Word of God brings growth. Uh, over in Second. Peter, or excuse me, 1 Peter chapter number 2, the Bible says this in verse number 2, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. Turn back to 2 Peter with me real quickly, if you would. 2 Peter and chapter number 3, and we'll read verse number 18 together. In 1 Peter 
Peter wrote that we are babes or babies when we get saved and that we can grow by the milk of the Word of God or how that the Word of God is like milk. It helps us to grow. In 2 Peter, Peter wrote in verse uh, chapter 3, verse number 18, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. We need to read our Bibles because it brings growth. It is going to help us to grow. If you aren't reading your Bible every day, you're not hurting the preacher. You're not even hurting other church members necessarily. You're hurting yourself because you're starving yourself. You need to make sure that you read something in God's Word every day. Uh, for new Christians, I always say try to at least read you know, a handful of verses in a chapter every day. But well, really, you should try to read at least a chapter a day. And those of you that are older Christians understand that it's important to get something out of the Word of God. If you read a chapter and you don't get something, keep reading until you get something, until God speaks to you about something. And remember, when you are reading the Word of God, don't be reading it because you want to find an answer to help so-and-so over here or because you need to convince this person of something. You need something from the Word of God. You know, I don't sit down in the morning and eat breakfast uh, because I want to help my kids later on in the day. Although when I do sit down and eat breakfast, I do get the strength I need so I can help my kids later on in the day. I sit down and eat breakfast because I need it. I sit down and eat lunch and supper because I need it. And my stomach tells me I need it. My body needs to get the energy from, or get the, the things from the food, the proteins and the carbohydrates, all those, those uh, nutrition, uh, nutritious things to help my body function so I can have the energy I need. But by sitting down and getting what I need, I am then able to help other people later on as well. And so make sure that you are growing. Make sure that you are spending time in God's Word every day. Second reason he gives, because the Word of God helps us resist temptation. Turn over to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. And verse 105, Psalm 119 and verse 105. The Bible says here in Psalm 119, 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We're going to be talking about the path of the upright man or walking uprightly in the morning service here in a little bit. But here the psalmist writes that the word of God is a lamp unto our feet. It gives us direction as we know the world world is full of darkness but the word of god is supposed to be that light that brightens our way as we live in this world we need to make sure that we spend time in god's word every day because not only is it going to help us grow but it's going to be like a lamp it's going to be like a light and it's going to give us light to direct us to show us where to go and where not to go uh, any of us that have lived through a power outage before or lived through a storm where that knocked out your electricity for some time knows that you get out the candles or you if you really thought ahead and checked all your batteries you get out the flashlights and as you're walking through the house you make sure you shine that light wherever you're walking because you don't know what you're going to trip on you don't know what you're going to step on uh, i can attest to the fact that having five kids it's definitely important to have a flashlight or a candle or something when the, the lights go out because you don't know what toy you're going to step on. And I don't know about you, but I've stepped on some toys that I thought for sure I just put something right through my foot because some of those toys are so hard and pointy. And man, I'm telling you what, that's what the Word of God does. Is it shows us where to go and where not to go. So it helps us with that temptation and to stay away from temptation, to stay away from things that are going to be a hindrance to us. D.L. Moody said this. He said, the, this Bible will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this Bible. Whenever I give people a, a new Bible, new Christians, I always try to write that inside on the inside cover of the Bible. This Bible will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this Bible. The third reason he gives is the Word of God has the power to change lives. Over to Hebrews 4 and verse number 12. And we actually read this last Sunday morning in the Sunday school hour as our verse of introduction. Hebrews 4 and verse number 12. 
The Bible says here, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God can change a person's life. It's compared here to a sword, a sword that is two-edged that can pierce the heart of an individual and, and cut through the callousness that they may have in their heart or in their life. Six, while traveling together on a train, well-known atheist Robert Ingersoll, who I mentioned before, uh, who said that in 15 years he was going to put uh, or 50 years, excuse me, he was going to put the uh, the Word of God in a morgue. He was traveling on a train with another man by the name of General Lew Wallace. And Wallace had decided that he should write a book dispelling the deity of Jesus or proving that Jesus was not the Son of God. And at the same time, disproving the authenticity of the Bible, that it wasn't God's Word, but that it was man's Word. Wallace agreed uh, when uh, Ingersoll talked to him about this, made that decision to write this book, and began to immerse himself in the life of Christ and studying the life of Christ. As he poured over the pages of the Bible, he found a conviction amounting to absolute belief in God and the divinity of Christ. In other words, as he studied the life of Christ, he was convinced that Jesus was the Savior of the world and that he was the Son of God. Through his study, he concluded the Bible and Christ both to be true, and became himself a devout Christian. General Wallace never wrote his book against the Bible. Instead, he wrote the classic Christian novel, Ben-Hur, The Tale of the Christ. And so the Word of God can change lives. That's why it's important for us to read it every day, because it's going to help us grow, because it's going to keep us from temptation, and because it's going to change our lives. We don't have time to look to the last few uh, things that Brother Chapel mentions here in this chapter, but I'd encourage you to read over those this week, especially how should we read our Bible. There's five questions given there that I'd recommend you, especially if you're a new Christian, that you ask yourself these questions each day after you read your Bible. Make sure that you get something out of it, because sometimes people say, well, how do I know if I got something or not? If you can answer one of these five questions after, you got, after you're done reading that chapter or two chapters or however many chapters you read each day, if you can answer one of these questions, then you got something out of your Bible reading that day. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all that you've